Thanks. I think I think Josh will also be rocking the cowboy boots later on. Oh, He's from yeah, Austin, you know. Sweet. Cody, Wyoming. <laughs> you get yours there. So first, let's just go through some stats. What sure. what are some of the Yelp's numbers? So in the last 30 days, or in the last calendar month, um, we saw 31 million unique visitors to the site on the web. Uh, on mobile, we've seen really nice traction and growth. So we're looking at 1.3 million active iPhone users alone. So that's been really nice for us. Uh, review content, we're now north of 10 million uh, reviews. And so compared to, I think, the competitive landscape, it, it's becoming sort of a one-horse race when it comes to, to local reviews. Uh, so, you know, really fantastic growth over the years, and, and we feel like we really have some of the best content, if not the best content in the business when it comes to finding great local businesses. Now, how has Yelp managed to grow that? You know, it all started back in the very beginning, it was 2004, uh, but really the site took off in uh, early 2005. And so we took a, a very local approach where we focused just on San Francisco. And uh, you know, initially wrote some reviews. People you know, started discovering the content just mostly through search engines. And that brought more users and started this wheel spinning where users would beget content, which would beget more users. Uh, and so it fed this cycle. And so by the end of 2005, we really had a vibrant community in San Francisco and a useful site where you could actually search and find all sorts of local businesses, uh, even beyond restaurants. And from that point, raised venture capital and then started growing to other cities. And so how has your data grown over that time? So, you know, it's been a pretty dramatic curve. I mean, now we're adding something like a million reviews uh, in less than three months. So every, like, wow. two and a half, something like that, months, we're adding a million reviews. Back then, I think, you know, 100,000 reviews in San Francisco was a really big deal. We were very mm -hmm. excited about that. Um, but, How much of that is spam? Uh, <laughs> there is, you know, I, in the early days, there probably wasn't that much because yeah. people don't really care. Uh, although you'd be surprised, uh, you know, in 2005, that was actually the point in time where we decided to add a review filter, uh, which screens out, tries to identify and screen out automatically uh, fake reviews, malicious reviews, sort of all the crufty stuff, and leave on the site uh, the best, most trustworthy content. Um, and at this point, we don't break out the percentage. It's a minority, but uh, it's something, it's a, a serious part of what we do, is try to figure out how do you connect people with these great local businesses when the more influential you become, the more important the rating becomes, uh, the more businesses have an incentive to spend time figuring out how do I get ranked higher. It, it's very similar to the, uh, to the game now that, that's played out with SEO. Uh, you know, sort of there's the white hat, I'm just going to do a really good job and I'm going to create a great website with great content and people are going to link to me. And then there's the black hat, dark arts, uh, where people are actively trying to play a game and, uh, and move up the rankings. And so, you know, we obviously love uh, businesses that are just doing a great job and allow things to happen organically, but there are, there are certainly folks out there that want to try and cut the line, so to speak. Now, other than your review filter, how, what are all the different ways that you actually manage and curate that data? Uh, so there's, there's a lot of moving parts, hours. sure. Yeah, so users, of course, add a lot of content. So they can add businesses, uh, we get a lot of those. They can also add photos, uh, update business information, add URLs, all those things. Uh, so we then spend a lot of time cleaning the content uh, and curating it. So we have a staff of, I think it's about 25 people now. Mm -hmm. um, that help moderate that content. Uh, they also look at reviews that get flagged for terms of service violations and things like that. Uh, we're also using Mechanical Turk. Uh, so you know, it hasn't been broadcast before, but we are users of Mechanical Turk. And that's been an interesting challenge to try and figure out, you know, how do you leverage that effectively? Um, what we found, interestingly enough, as we, as we started to scale it up, was that there are people in the Mechanical Turk world uh, that have written bots that will actually try and just click on your on your uh, hits, as they're called, uh, your units of work, and uh, just try to make money. And so you have to put, you have, we had to invest quite a bit in infrastructure to make sure that the people working on our hits were actual humans. Wow, so you guys robots. are getting spam from both ends. <laughs> yeah, you can't win. Um, but, but we found actually Mechanical Turk, once you get it right, you know, it actually is, is quite helpful. So what data do you send over there, and how, you know, do you have to run through it multiple times, or is it, can you trust just a single hit? Um, so we do have multiple people look at everything. 
uh, and then make decisions. Uh, but yeah, we, you just put out and sort of create a form uh, that asks questions about the content, asks the user to do some research, stuff that our internal folks might do as well. We, we try to take the simplest, most straightforward problems and put those on Turk, and then we keep the more complex work in-house. Um, and then we find that you know, it gets done relatively quickly. As long as you have a, a hit on Turk that's relatively straightforward that users are comfortable doing and feel like they're not getting confused all the time, then it tends to get done. Now, you guys also use Hadoop a lot internally. What are you using yeah. that for? Um, we, we gather a lot of data, so we use it to process all of our web logs. Uh, we've also created some features out of it. So um, specifically, if you're on a business page, you can see people who view this also viewed something. Uh, and so it shows you related businesses. And so you know, for that, we're analyzing web logs to pull out interesting data. I believe it's also used now for um, our review highlights feature. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is basically doing you know, sentiment analysis and, and looking at all the reviews and pulling out interesting phrases. I believe it's used in that case as well. Now, touching on the review sentiment, uh, review highlights, tell mm -hmm. me about that feature. Um, so what we're doing is, for a specific business, we're pouring over all the reviews that we have. And we're trying to pick out key positive phrases uh, that are, especially on topics that are mentioned you know, several times. So, if you know, the lobster bisque is, is one of the best dishes, presumably it comes up several times, if not you know, 20 or 30 times, in the reviews that we've, we've gathered on a particular business. And so we can see, okay, there's something going on with the lobster bisque, and then we're looking for positive phrases, and then we're able to pick a really good one, and that goes into this review highlights section um, that, that's shown on the, just below the business information. So it's been a really great way to distill the essence of all of the reviews down. It's sort of like you know, some people enjoy Zagat for its brevity. So you know, obviously there's a benefit to Yelp in that some of the reviews are really rich and deep, and you want that content. But other times you just yeah, want okay, stories boil it. Sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're we're known for that. Um, but sometimes you just want to boil it down to the brass tacks, and so that is our our best effort. And I think it works actually really well um, to to just pull it down to what are, what are the few things you need to know about this business. And we've also integrated that back onto the mobile platform, where I think it's particularly effective, because on mobile, you kind of just want a couple of snippets of, okay, what's the deal with this business? And so by looking at that first, you can get a quick sense of like, okay, what are the best dishes? Or you know, who's the hairstylist that, that's mentioned most often, things like that. Yeah, you guys have really moved into mobile. What's your growth like there? Um, well, it's been pretty dramatic since you know, the iPhone. The iPhone, of course, changed everything. I think everyone here probably is well aware of that. Um, and so we were there at the, the beginning uh, of the iPhone app store and uh, got a pretty big boost uh, just from being early and, and getting some attention and love from Apple promotion. Uh, we were in a commercial as well. And so that, that helped us in the early days. And then um, you know, several, I guess it's now been several months ago, we launched Monocle, which was uh, another big boost for us. And so Monocle is this feature uh, that uses augmented reality, leverages augmented reality. And essentially, you can hold it up when you're walking down a street, and it'll show you the businesses that are in front of you. Uh, it show the star rating. You can just tap on it, and then it pulls up the business's page. And so we didn't really realize that that would be such a big deal when, when we prototyped it and, and put it in there. It was buried initially as, a, as an Easter egg. Uh, but once it got out there, it was just a... Quite a, a and wasn't it force. kind of a, it was a story of the, the tail wagging the dog in this case? Yeah, so the, the interesting story be, uh, behind how Monocle came about was we had a, I remember having a, we had a conversation in the office, a couple engineers, myself, about wouldn't it be amazing if you could just walk up to a business and hold up your phone, point it at the business, and it would say, this is the star rating before you walked in. You didn't have to do anything sort of hands-free, and you could just walk down the street with that. So it was kind of a neat vision um, that we were just tossing around. And somehow that conversation leaked out. Uh, and soon after, a couple days after, I think Scoble uh, had, a, had a post or a tweet, it might have been uh, on FriendFeed actually, where he said, Yelp is going to come up with, or is working on the most incredible feature ever involving the compass. And I don't know if he mentioned augmented reality or not. Um, but we hadn't actually started on anything. We weren't building anything. We had just had this discussion. And so then, actually, an intern of ours uh, got really excited and decided he would prototype it and see if it could be done. And so we started working on it. Um, and once he, he showed us a working prototype, we were definitely wowed. But we thought, you know, it's an early technology. It's a little rough. Our location data isn't that accurate. Maybe it, it might not be that useful, but it, it is awfully cool. Uh, so why don't we bury it as an Easter egg, you know, intern, if you can get it done. 
And so I gave him a good challenge, and, and he plugged away on it uh, for, I don't know, a month or so. And, uh, and we were able to get it into our, our release. And then, of course, the release came out. Uh, word got out about the Easter egg, and it just blew up on us. It, it was sort of beyond our, our expectations. We had no idea. <laughs> and that boosted your traffic up by like 50%? Yeah, I think mobile traffic rose by like 40 or 50%. And it really, it wasn't just sort of an up and down. It was really a pop and sort of sustained. Yeah, I really see that, I mean, augmented reality on the phone is just, you know, it's what satellite maps were, or satellite imagery was back in 2005, where it's, it's the new view. You yeah. need to have it there. And yeah. I mean, it, it looks really cool, and I think it'll get better and better. I think, you know, there is a lot of hype around it. Like, the, the technology's still early. It's probably a few years off before we have really, really practical applications. I think it is useful, but it's, you know, it's still something that I think early adopters get a, a huge kick out of. But I don't know that it'll go mainstream for a little while. Now, you also have added check-ins. Mm -hmm. So that's associated with apps like Foursquare and Gowalla, but sure. a feature is a feature. Where, <laughs> Where are you going with that? Yeah, I think for us, you know, we had all of this traction on mobile, and it made a heck of a lot of sense to allow our users to check in. Uh, it also feeds back into actually the website, which is, of course, all about contributing reviews. And so when someone checks in, we can now add an extra piece of data that not only did you write this review, but you were also, you also essentially validated that you were there, at least in proximity to what you wrote the review about. So we thought that was valuable. Um, and then just you know, providing it to our, our existing users seemed like it'd be a fun thing. So we rolled that out, and uh, we've actually seen a really nice rise in contributions from the phone, other contributions besides check-in. So we saw you know, 6x the number of quick tips, which is just so, sort of short Twitter-sized blurbs you can write about a business. Um, and then we saw 4x times, uh, or 4x the number of photos uh, added as a result. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you just get more engagement. People are opening it up to check in. They can post on Twitter. They can post on Facebook. Uh, it's a fun activity. And then they happen to be there, I think, these other Things like tips and photos are just right in front of them. So, of course, they use it on occasion. It's great. And what have the business owners done with this data? The business owners? Yeah. Um, I mean, in the case of photos, it just helps them out because you know, a lot of business owners are or the, still... The check-in, specifically. Oh. So we haven't integrated check-in data uh, into our business owner site. We have a site, biz.yelp.com, where business owners can unlock, uh, unlock their Yelp page and get access to all sorts of tools. It, right now, we're just in this sort of letting the feature grow, gathering data, seeing what we can do with it. Um, and then I, I could definitely see integrating that back in so business owners can see that people have, have come in their store. But I, I do think it'll always be a sample. You know, just like reviews are a sample of the customers that have walked in the door, I think check-ins will always be a sample of customers that come in the door. I don't see it as something that necessarily, every, every single person that walks in is going to be checking in. Mm -hmm. How many businesses have actually claimed their pages on Yelp? Um, I don't think we've ever broken out that number. It's many, many thousands. Uh, we've seen a lot of success, and, and obviously it's to business owners' benefit. They can do all sorts of cool things, like they can message reviewers, they can publicly comment on a review if they want to thank the person or, or if there's been a tough situation. They can also add photos. Uh, they can even add a special announcement or offer, a coupon, that kind of thing right to their page for free, and that actually gets distributed on related businesses for free. So there's a lot of advantages to it, um, and people are, are taking, taking us up on it, but we haven't released that number. What's going on with the, there's been a lot of discussion around reviewer gate, or review gate. Sure. And we talked about it backstage a bit. Can you delve into it here? Yeah, so I think at the core uh, of the, the concerns and the controversy is we have this review filter. Uh, that we were talking about, which is designed to protect the site and make sure that the reviews on the page are essentially organic, that you know white hat SEO prevails and not black hat. Um, and so what that means is reviews come and go. So you, you might have 10 reviews on your page today, and you might have nine tomorrow. And in some cases, if you've been soliciting lots of reviews from, say, friends and family, you might have 12 reviews on your page today and two tomorrow, because we detected that and, and took those reviews off your page. So you add into that then the fact that we have a sales force that's calling all local businesses, and you might receive a call, and then your reviews fluctuate. Now you have sort of a correlation causation. Was the call related to the review filter? Was it related to the reviews going down? So, so that confusion is out there, and uh, it's certainly painful. But you know, we're doing our best to, to get out in front of businesses. Uh, we have a manager of local business outreach that's at every local business function he can possibly find uh, to help educate businesses. And we're building up the content on the site 
uh, in ways to try and make it as easy and simple as possible for businesses to understand what's going on, why is it happening, and why it's, it's actually in their best interest. Now, I wonder, if you, could you just have another like, page off to the side that shows all the reviews unfiltered? That, you know, so you have the, mm -hmm. you know, the canonical ones, the ones that you've blessed, and right. then you have off to the side, basically, like the confidence with, yeah, with we, a confidence rating. We certainly consider that. Uh, thus far, we haven't done that just because we see it as it's, it's the corp. It basically gives you this corpus of reviews that you can then start analyzing and say, OK, what are the things that Yelp is, is looking at to try and, um, and identify fishy reviews? Mm -hmm. And so we've thus far hidden that data. Uh, but it's certainly a possibility uh, we can do that. It's all about the secret sauce of the algorithms. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a similar problem that a lot of companies face, whether it's you know, credit card fraud when you get you know, rejected on a credit card transaction. If you call them and say, you know, why did this get rejected? Like, a lot of times they're not going to tell you a whole lot about sort of the details of what went into that decision. And similarly with Google and click fraud, let's say, or even their page rank algorithm, there's going to be a lot of mystery, sort of security through obscurity, which... You know, it's not ideal, but it's a very difficult problem that we face in trying to say, okay, here's a totally open system where anyone can contribute, but we still want to maintain the utility of the site. So as it becomes more important, there is this temptation uh, to try and muck with our rankings, to try and manipulate the reputation, and ultimately we just want to get consumers to the best local businesses. So there is a, a conflict, a tension there. All right. Uh, if anybody wants to ask some questions, just go up to the mic, and we'll, we'll try and fire it through two or three. But in the meantime... Uh, you know, you get a lot of your traffic from Google. How did it feel when Google launched Place Pages? You know, they've been competing with us since 2005 or six, I think. So I didn't see Google Place Pages as uh, a hugely different product than what they already had. I think they added some pages on um, sort of more generic things like San Francisco or on a, a specific, specific neighborhood. page per business, as opposed yeah. to kind of buried in the listings. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it really changed the game for us. I think it affected, in, for the folks that have more commodity content, um, where it's just basic business listings, uh, I think it, it had a, a pretty significant impact because users were coming to that site just for very basic info. I think, you know, for us, you know, the last year we saw north of 60% growth on the website in the face of all of that. And I think it speaks to the quality of our content and the fact that what we have is very unique. Um, and we have, you know, communities and cities all across the country, and now in including some outside uh, the country, where people are writing these rich reviews about all sorts of local businesses. So beyond restaurants, you know, it's chiropractors, it's hair salons, whatever you need. Um, and if you have that very unique content, then people will come to that. They'll jump over the roadblocks, and they'll find it. So, so far, you know, knock on wood, it's mm -hmm. actually been really good for us. We haven't seen any problems with it. And so... You know, you obviously think about this a lot. Where do you see the local industry going? Like, um, you know, certainly the, the whole location awareness and, and the mobile side of things changes the landscape a lot. I think over, you know, the next few years, I would be surprised if, you know, 50% of our traffic wasn't coming from just mobile. Yeah, and like, what I is think, your growth Mary, like with mobile right now? It, it's very, I don't have the numbers. It's in the probably hundreds of, of percent um, a year. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I think there, there will always be some element of you're doing the research, you're at home, you're relaxed, you're on your web browser, you're checking Yelp, you're searching, you're poking around. But then there's the on-the-go, which is a different use case, but marry, you would still want to marry the same data. Um, and so I, I can't imagine a situation where there wouldn't be a huge percentage of our traffic tapping into that data on-the-go. We're already seeing all the early adopters and all the iPhone people using it really heavily. Um, and in fact, the usage pattern is different. You can actually see you know, our traffic... You know, generally, it's pretty high, like Mondays, as people get back, there's a lot of write traffic, people contributing reviews. And then there's also a high sort of later in the week as people are planning their weekend at the office. Um, and then on the weekends, that's when the mobile stuff comes out, especially Saturday is the peak day for mobile. Hmm. And what percentage of reviews come in? Like, is it mostly for reading or is it also for writing? On and the mobile, you know, other than on mobile, tip. mobile, we see a lot of contributions on the, on the shorter stuff. We've actually designed it that way. Okay. So we didn't want to, you know, erode the, the quality of content, the quality of review content, because essentially on the on mobile, your your sort of incentives are just to get the thing done, to write something short, and to bang it out. And so we wanted a different experience on mobile, a different way to contribute. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming out. I hope you stick around for the rest of the conference. Thanks for having the me. Rest of the morning. Thank you very much, Jeremy.